Our guest of honor this evening is Dr. Mark Tovey, who is an adjunct professor here at Western and who is the history curator here at the Cronin <coughs> Observatory. And tonight is a very special night for Mark. He has uh, produced a book, which he's going to tell you about. And tonight is the official launch of that book. This is the book right here. Take it away, Mark. Mark. Okay, so being the observatory curator here at the observatory, um, you know, one of the one of the wonderful things about that is that I get to be there at many what I like to call Indiana Jones moments. Okay, so I got I got my first inkling of this particular Indiana Jones moment. Uh, via a phone call. Peter Jack here over there called me up and said rather mysteriously, Mark, I'm going to do my best to boom Peter Jack your voice. Mark, uh, have you ever heard of somebody called Beatrice Welling? And I said, yeah, no, Peter, it, it doesn't, I'm not sure, right? it doesn't mean anything. He said, okay, I'll see you tonight. And he shows up at the observatory without any announcement with a sheath of yellowed paper. In fact, this sheaf of yellow paper. And he said to me, here, Mark, do something with this. And so I did. Peter had discovered something remarkable. You're not on screen, Mark. Am I on screen again? Something. Uh, that's probably this. We're fine. We're fine. I want to keep it playing for a oh, moment okay. so that folks are folks and you and the manuscript. Okay, so Peter had discovered something remarkable. The yellowed paper is a typed manuscript. Can you kind of see that there's typing on that? And the screen that you can see there accompanying the manuscript was dated January the 25th, 1944. And it was addressed to the director of the Cronin Observatory. When that letter was written, if you think about it, World War II was still more than a year away. Okay, World War II is still raging, and the letter begins with what can only be described as a line from a detective novel. A few words of explanation of this parcel seem to be in order. You could almost imagine that letter being addressed to Sherlock Holmes. The letter was signed, Beatrice W. Welling. While reading poetry one day, she says, I don't know if she had a prison British accent, but we'll go with it. It suddenly occurred to me that out of the wealth of lovely things the poets have said about the stars, a little collection might be compiled of some of the most beautiful short poems, parts of longer poems, apt quotations, etc all being about heavenly bodies and other celestial phenomena, and such a collection might prove of a little interest to the observatory. Once this idea had taken root, it firmly refused to be dismissed. I could never get rid of it. So the idea of gathering a quotation gradually grew and grew, and the accompanying cosmic calendar is the result. <coughs> Welling. Welling and welcome. Welling and assembled an anthology of poems, of poems about the heavens. And what made this anthology particularly intriguing is that she had selected passages to accompany each week of the year. Many of the quotations, she says, are most appropriate to a particular time of the year, and I tried to place them there, perhaps not always with complete success. The collection she assembled includes a poem for every week in the calendar year. She had also attempted to provide as much variety as possible. She consciously included hymns, lyrics, sonnets, quatrains, rhyming couplets, blank verse, and a number of other forms. Referring to her manuscript, her letter concludes, it would please me very much if you would kindly accept it as a small offering to the observatory and a poetic tribute, as it were, to astronomy and the work of astronomers. Clearly, she had been inspired by her encounter with the observatory, but how and when? Well, 
one of the most important first clues was discovered by Henry Parskus, who's right there hiding in the back. Um, and it was this. It was her name in the visitor's register, the guest book for the observatory, as you can see there for April the 30th, 1941. So let's count this out. Uh, uh, September 25th, the observatory opens. So September to October, November, December, January. Four months later to the day, Beatrice Wallen shows up at the door. And the signature at the bottom of that letter is a match for the one in the guest book. So we know that this is the self-same Beatrice Wellen. And in fact, we know that she came twice to the observatory. And what she would have seen when the observatory first opened would have, I think, left an impression. Now, um, at that time, the observatory, uh, when you walked in the front doors, boom, right there was the largest meteorite fall ever to fall anywhere and be recovered in Canada. You know, so you can just imagine what an impression that would make in the lobby. And upstairs in the dome, she would have obviously taken the opportunity to view the heavens through the large 10-inch refracting telescope. Um, even today, at 10 inches in diameter, that telescope is currently the largest refracting telescope in Canada. So that is really uh, an exciting resource that we have here. Um, but at the time, it really would have been amazing to see that piece of glass. So Beatrice was, how to put this, uniquely suited, I think, for a project at the intersection of the arts and the sciences. She went to the University of New Brunswick, Fredericton, and one of the things about the University of New Brunswick Fredericton that is worth knowing for this context is it has the oldest observatory in Canada, and it is also known as the Poets Corner of Canada. And the reason it's known as the Poets Corner of Canada is because three of its most illustrious alumni were also three of Canada's most illustrious poets, and they're buried there. Okay, so hence Poets Corner of Canada. <clears throat> and uh, at UNB, she won a gold medal um, in English for her essay surveying women's role in English literature. After her undergraduate work, she goes on to Radcliffe, which is a college at Harvard. But she wasn't done then. She then went on to earn her PSC in library science at Simmons University. So she spent time, uh, first of all, cataloging uh, at the University of Chicago Library. That's what it would have looked like at the time that she was there uh, in the late teens, early 20s. She worked as a librarian for the Vancouver Public Library. She got around. And uh, probably notably, as a professional librarian really moving into her career for the National Research Council of Canada Library. So one of her jobs literally was as a science librarian. And it's also worth noting, because we're here in this room, that that gentleman on the wall, uh, Hume Cronin Sr., not the star of stage and screen, but the chair of the committee that founds the National Research Council of Canada. So as I've learned at this place, it's all connected behind the frames. Finally, Welling landed a permanent position here at Western University in Lawson Library, where she co-taught a mandatory half course on how to use the library, uh, which is a wonderful thing that we don't have anymore. However, you can just imagine this. Every single undergraduate at Western would have known her personally, right? Because she taught every single, every undergraduate at Western University. So she would have been a name on campus at that time. Uh, I bet you she also had a nickname because her co-teacher, Catherine Cable, did have a nickname, which was Card Catalog Katie. Um, and uh, so I would dearly love history to record what, uh, what Beatrice Welling's nickname was as well. Uh, however, uh, she and Catherine Campbell um, wrote a book together as well. So they started by her teaching this course, and they followed it up with the first book on library science ever published in Canada. Here we are 
on Pittman. It went through three editions. Um, and so already in 1936, this story takes place, um, she's on the national stage. We have a little techno here. Um, I did unmute myself. Unmute, unmute yourself. I, I already did, okay. but I'll do that again. Uh, is, is it working now? We'll, we'll check. I'll All let right. you know. I'll let you know. You'll let me know? Okay, okay fantastic. fantastic. So, um, Library Science for Canadians, three editions with Pittman. So, uh, she's already gaining herself a national reputation, and she certainly has a reputation around the campus. Um, she and Carl Catalog Katie. And uh, when I bought this book, uh, it had an exam paper for her course in here, which was the most intriguing thing about the whole, the whole piece, uh, because Lauren well, didn't mess around. She had a question four on her exam paper, 15 marks, outline the organization of the county library systems in Western Ontario. Yay! So, finding intentional treasures, you might say, came naturally to the trust well. And if we did it into her book on library science, um, especially the bibliography at the end, which she was exclusively responsible for writing, Okay, we can start to gain some insight into where and how she gathered resources for this manuscript, for this collection, for this anthology of poetry. So the following, she says, are amongst the best collections of English and American poetry. And then she lists them. In fact, her uh, library science lists 16 different English poetry anthologies, including synoptic collections of verse, as well as Scottish, Irish, and American poetry, modern verse, and ballads. And this is an annotated book, bibliography, so she knew these books. She didn't just list them. So she was armed with the appropriate gear. I think you'll agree. She had the tools. The list also includes a collection by Confederation poet Bliss Harmon, who uh, went to her undergraduate institution, as I say, in UNB. Uh, two generations before, and Welling included four of his poems, of those kinds of poems, in her manuscript and anthology. It's, it's also, also worth noting that she, she, she goes to a separate section, section in here to Canadian verse. Okay, okay. So, so there's, there's the 16 selection verse, verse, and then there's, there's uh, uh, 10 10 selection in Canadian verse, verse, plus an additional plus three, three collections, collections French Canadian, French -Canadian, French -Canadian poems. poems. Wow. wow. So, so she used her skills developed in her training and in her professional life to ferret out astronomically themed poems dating back centuries. And crucially for this collection, arranging them by the calendar year. So each of the 52 weeks in the year has one poem devoted to it. The poems are largely from the 17th to the 19th centuries, with a little bit of 20th century action thrown in. And you'll very likely be familiar with some of the names that you will find in this book. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Lord Byron, Robert Louis Stevenson, Alfred Lord Tennyson. As such, the voices and the cadences are familiar. But since they're astronomy poems, since they're rarely anthologized, they feel fresh. So you get that lovely combination of coming to writers that you love and then seeing something from them you've never seen before. That, that was quite, quite a shock to me as I, you know, flipped through or even that. that. I, you know, that very same night when I took it home, I just went through the whole thing. So it's a lovely combination. Here's a passage, for instance, from Child Harold's Pilgrimage by Lord Byron, chosen by Welling for the first week in June. So I'm going to read this first poem, and then I'm going to start picking on some of my friends who are in the audience. Um, but uh, this, this one says, these stars, actually, Tony, can I trouble you to grab maybe about four copies of the anthology and just park them on the chair over there so that I have them ready as props. Ye stars, which are the poetry of heaven, if they were bright leaves, we would read the fate of men and empires, tis to be forgiven. That in our aspirations to be great, our destinies 
overlap their moral state and claim a kindred with you. For ye are a beauty and a master, and create in us such love and reverence from afar that fortune, fame, power, life have named themselves a star. So Byron is saying, because the stars are so impressive, because they seem to resonate with this as the very poetry of the universe, of course, it's very natural that we would that we would try to somehow divine our future from the stars. Um, and maybe we can be forgiven for that. Well, Welling also included a number of female poets from the 19th and 20th century whose names may not be household names, but who are figures worth remembering. These include Ethel Fuller, Eleanor Fargeron, Catherine Riggs, Alice Manel, and particularly spine tingling is Marjorie Pickfall's poem, Stars. Now in the west, the slender moon lies low, and now Orion glimmers through the trees, clearing the earth with even pace and slow. And now, the stately moving Pleiades in that soft, infinite darkness overhead hang jewel-wise on a silver thread. And all the lonelier stars that have their place, calm lamps within the distant southern sky, and planet dust upon the edge of space look down upon the fretful world, and I look up to the other vastness unafraid and see the stars which sang when earth was made. In 1944, World War II still raged. Perhaps because the manuscript was compiled and received during the war, it was never published. We may never know the full story, but it was filed away and forgotten for 75 years until Peter Jenicke rediscovered it and recognized its cultural significance. Had it been published in 1944, it would have been a pioneering work, perhaps the first ever anthology of astronomy poetry. That gives me chills. Tonight, now, now, here with you, we're officially bringing Beatrice Welling's manuscript back to light, and I couldn't be more excited. Although a necessary portion of my work for this project was design and editorial, my self-chosen burden was to select astronomical art from previous centuries to resonate and dialogue with the poems that Beatrice Welling had chosen. The book, um, which we have copies available here tonight, if you wish to purchase one, contains at least one poem and at least one piece of astronomical art for each week of the year. This poem that you can see here by Robert Louis Stevenson beautifully captures the experience of the amateur astronomer beginning an evening of observation. Here in the quiet eye, my thankful eyes receive the quiet light. I see the trees stand fair against the faded air, and star by star prepare the perfect night. And in my bosom, lo, content and quiet grow toward perfect peace. And now when day is done, brief day of wind and sun, the pure stars, one by one, their troop increase. Charles Sumner was uh, an influential anti-slavery activist. And he was a lifelong friend of Charles Wadsworth Longfellow. Okay. And uh, Longfellow's poem about him celebrating his life reminds us the idea of light traveling uh, for very long times to reach us. And at a finite time from distant stars, hence showing us the past, predates the 20th century. We usually think of that in connection with Einstein, but it's really a much older idea than that. And so he rather beautifully personifies that um, in his uh, poem here. And he says, we're a star quenched on high, 
For ages would its light, still traveling downward from the sky, shine on our mortal sight. So when a great man dies, for years beyond our ken, the light he leaves behind him lies upon the paths of men. I decided right away that there wasn't going to be any nudity in this book. No nudity. And although you wouldn't think it, that is surprisingly hard to achieve for a book about astronomical poetry. <laughs> Who knew? If you Google for images of the mythological Venus, how many examples do you think you will find that are fully clothed? Almost none. The one you found. The one I found, exactly. The one I found. The current version of Wikipedia is very clear at this point. It says the goddess Venus is usually depicted nude in paintings. Within these covers, you will find gorgeous images of transits of Venus or the topography of Mars, but not the topography of Roman goddesses or gods. It is, I am afraid, relentlessly wholesome. You will, however, learn about Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, who was identified um, in her lifetime with Diana, the Huntress. This may have had something to do with Elizabeth I's vaunted chastity, but may also have alluded to Her Majesty's tendency towards executing those who displeased her. Ben Johnson in this poem entreats the Queen to let not her axe fall on him. <laughs> uh, ben Johnson's hymn to Diana. Um, I can find it here. <coughs> we'll be read by Peter Jenny for a minute. You'd be willing to read it off the screen, Peter? Uh, I've read this before. You I've have indeed read it before. That's why I'm putting on the spot. Queen and Huntress, chaste and fair, now the sun is laid to sleep, seated in thy silver chair, state and wanted manner keep. Hesperus entreats thy light, goddess exceedingly bright. Earth, let not thy envious shade dare itself to interpose. Cynthia's shining orb was made, heaven to clear when day did close. Bless us then with wished sight, goddess excellently bright. Lay thou bow of pearl apart, and thy crystal shining quiver. Give unto the flying heart space to breathe, how short soever. Thou that makes the day of night, goddess, excellently bright. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Peter. I am so glad you were able to lend your stentorian voice to this evening. Uh, ben Johnson's great rival as a poet and playwright was, of course, William Shakespeare. And no book of astronomical poetry would be complete. Uh, as our own David Levy will attest, uh, is David in the house? We need to get him online promoted too. Uh, and he's on, yes. Okay. Um, without gems from the bard. As I am sure that you were aware, uh, David is notable not only for co-discovering Comet Shoemaker Levy 9, which is the comet that crashed legendarily into Jupiter, he's also an expert on astronomical poetry. And when I say expert, I mean he wrote his PhD dissertation on the subject. He knows his poems of the stars. Um, so uh, we have him remotely from Arizona on Zoom, uh, and they're just going to try and see if they can get that working. But, you know, I mean, meanwhile, there's no such thing as too little Shakespeare. So uh, I'm wondering if I could put... Um, another one of my friends on the spot. Could I put you on the spot, for instance? Would you be willing to read? David? He's got to check if he's got his glasses. I have always wanted to hear this man read Shakespeare. So this is, <laughs> he's, he's, all right? Fantastic. So all three of them, please and thank you.
these earthly god fathers of heaven's lights give a name to every excellent star, but not more prophets and shining nights than those that walk and know not where they are. It's the star, stars above us, govern our condition. Men at some times are masters of their fears. Hope, dear Bruce, is not in our stuff, but in ourselves that we are thinking. David used to teach Shakespeare. And so it's delightful to have another PhD in English literature in the house. Um, uh, not only teaching Shakespeare, but teaching acting of Shakespeare. And uh, so this is this is something, and anyway, thank you so much, David. Thank you for letting me put you on the spot. That was lovely. Is the other David, is David H. Levy in the house? No, he's not. Okay, well, we might come back to him. We can just see how that all goes. Uh, it'd be lovely to do that. But poets, as it turns out, love antique constellation names. The asterism that we think of as the Big Dipper, for example, um, was once thought of as a wagon rather than a dipper. Charles's wagon or Charles's wing. Can you see how it might have been viewed as a wagon? We danced about the maypole and in the hazel copse till Charles's wing came out above the tall white chimney tops. And one of the charms of this for me has been getting myself acquainted with all of these antiquated terms, they're really quite charming. And when you think about them, you can start to see how people would have viewed constellations using different names and figured them in different kinds of ways. Um, so I had a great deal of fun looking all of that stuff up and just making sure that it's all there in the notes in case you're scratching your head. It's, this is uh, you know, not designed to be an exercise in head scratching, but simply a pure pleasure before a night's sleep. So, uh, and the author of uh, the lyrics to the song, Morning Has Broken, also wrote lines about um, the night and the way it inevitably slips away. Eleanor Fargon's poem could almost be an astronomer's lament on a perfectly clear night, which you know must end. The night will never stay. The night will still go by, though with a million stars you pin it to the sky. Though you bind it with the blowing wind and buckle it with the moon, the night will slip away like sorrow for a tomb. Thank you so much, Pauline. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm chair of the physics and astronomy department, and also a noted local science fiction author. Um, something you may not have known about Pauline, but she writes absolutely fantastic short, short spec back. In preparing this book for publication, I attempted to produce a volume that surely would have delighted Beatrice Welling, and which I hope will delight the reader as well. And there's one last thing. In June of 1908, Beatrice Welling went to a 10-day summer camp at Silver Bay in the Adirondack Mountains. So dark, dark skies. 21-year-old Beatrice describes the scene as she arrives. Make no mistake about the Adirondacks. They are not imposing in their grandeur at all. An atmosphere of peace and serenity is theirs, and they look down on Lake George with a massive protecting substantiality that is very comfortable. As the sun went down, a deep shade fell on their purple peaks, which girded the lake around, while the fluffy clouds that floated over them burned with crimson and gold. And when the splendors of the sunset's gold were fading, the climbing moon rose suddenly over a distant mountain. And so we know that Beatrice Welling has experienced truly dark skies because we know where she was and we know how dark it is there. So she knows what 
an overwhelming experience, truly dark skies uh, can be. So much later, this is the scene that Welling might have had in her mind's eye in the 1940s when she added this section of Lord Byron's poem, The Cloud, to her manuscript. That, and so this is a poem literally about a cloud. That orbit, let me try that one more time. That orbit made with white fire flame. That's just not going to work. Okay, let me try this again. That orbit maiden with white fire lady, whom mortals call the moon, glides glimmering o'er my fleece like floor by midnight breezes strewn, and wherever the beat of her unseen feet, which only the angels here may have broken the woof of my tense thin roof. The stars peep beneath and behind her and peer, and I laugh to see them whirl and flee like a swarm of golden bees when I widen the rent in my wind-built wind tent till the calm rivers, lakes, and seas, like strips of the sky falling through me on high, are each paved with the moon and these. Welling remembers at the end of the last day, everyone streaming out into the swarm and starry night. The 10 days conference was over, and all its associations and the wondrous prospects of scenery became an influence and a memory. Perhaps she was thinking back to that very moment when she included that final selection from Byron. And one of the lovely things that came out of a dialogue with the, with the University of New Brunswick archivist was a poem that Beatrice Wallen herself had written and published in the University of New Brunswick's uh, 1908 University Monthly. And I'm wondering, John B., uh, if you might be willing to read Beatrice Welling's poem, perhaps uh, along with the description that she included in the magazine of the mythological background for this. So the lovely thing about this is it is an astronomy poem. Beatrice Welling herself wrote an astronomy poem. And I think when you hear this, you will also agree that she not only knew how to anthologize astronomy poetry, but she also knew how to write it. From Bullfinch's beauty of mythology, Orion was the son of Neptune. He was handsome, a handsome giant, a mighty hunter. His father gave him the power of wading through the sea, or as, as, as others say, of walking on its surface. He was so great a favorite with Diana, the goddess of the chase, that her brother Apollo was highly displeased and often chid, chid her but to no purpose. One day, observing Orion wading through the sea with his head just above the water, Apollo pointed it out to his sister and maintained that she could not hit that black thing in the sea. The archer goddess discharged a, sec a shaft with fatal aim. The waves rolled the dead body of Orion to the land and bewailing her fatal error with many tears, Diana placed him among the stars where he appears as a giant with a girdled sword, lion skin, and club. Sirius, his dog, follows him, and the Pleiades fly before him. And the poem, Orion and Diana. Aurora coming over the Latin heights, coaxes the gray Aegean to a rosy smile. Clear ether vibrates with a hundred lights, a warmth translucent wraps Olympus pile. Reckless of fate's grim comedy impending, Diana from her waning crest descending, a quiver from her naked arm suspending, hails her puissant uh, brother in the car of day. Far on the lofty hills, the heavenly twain, in ominous stillness, lies the ocean strand, a purpose taunt. The goddess boasts a truthful aim, 
a sudden shaft shot quickly and too well. As in scorn the darkening ocean swell flings up the form of child Orion on the sand. John B. Lee, ladies and gentlemen, uh, himself uh, a professional poet and winner of 70 international awards for poetry. You should check out his stuff sometime. So uh, thank you for all of the readers for their kind participation. Uh, to Henry Leparskis, wherever he is back, there you are, Henry. Uh, and to Marianne Lee, who both provide in-depth uh, reading of the manuscript. Any errors are, of course, my own. Um, thank you. Big shout out to the London Heritage Council and the City of London for funding this publication. And uh, thank you all for your kind, kind attention this evening. And of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. What questions do you have? Pauline. So what do we know about Llewellyn's life after she handed her manuscript over to the observatory? She continued working at Western until her retirement. Um, I think rather notably, she was uh, called upon by her alma mater's university president to offer technical advice on their library. Uh, and there's a report in the, in the archives about that. Um, her alma mater called on her on a regular basis to provide them with reports. And so they remembered her very favorably. Um, she, uh, after her retirement, she moved back to uh, the University uh, uh, to Fredericton and um, became a member of the Historical Society there and continued on her uh, engagements and scholarly work and traveled all around the countryside. Um, and uh, so she seemed to have been a very curious and very active mind throughout her life. Uh, I would have been very glad to know her. I discovered that her piano is in the archives in the Museum of the Historical Society in Fredericton because I I reached out to them too, of course. Um, so there are probably little artifacts out there that uh, we were still going to be able to track down from Beatrice Welling. I just I find her a fascinating character. Henry Henry reached out to the Harvard uh, University Library and found a photograph um, of her year uh, when she was attending Radcliffe. Um, so bit by bit, we're piecing together her story, and I I hope to shed a little bit more light on a. On, on a Canadian, an important early Canadian figure um, uh, who also did a beautiful thing for all of us in spending so much time uh, finding so many beautiful poems. David. Uh, not a question, but yes. just a comment. Uh, my dad went here in the 40s, and he had her as a president. He told us I have to get that course in order to pass. He also said wow. he had this, they all had to swim a lap in the pool in order to, to graduate. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. If I had a chair to fall off right now, I'd do exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> David, you made my night. That's, That's incredible. Yeah. So if there are no other questions, um, uh, I would be very happy to. Oh, Henry. Did you have any? One image or images that were really difficult to, to find or to match to poems at all that, that stand out in your mind? Oh my gosh, yes. Any special images? <sighs> well, okay, first of all, I should just say that the process for this, um, I made a very, very large spreadsheet. Okay, that's where I started. I went through each poem and I extracted keywords from every poem and I put them in the spreadsheet week by week throughout the year. And then I started searching for those keywords. Um, I discovered very quickly that Google Images is the wrong way to do that. Partly because you get mostly copyrighted images and mostly low resolution images. And when you need print quality and you need things that are in the public domain, um, it's not there for you, alas. Even if you turn on the creative continuity. So you have to go searching for art collections, which have digitized their art in very high resolution, 
um, and will allow you to download them in high resolution and to publish them for free. So that's, uh, that's crucially important. And what I really wanted to do also is make this into a resource for people who, when they see an image in here, they can flip to the back and get all of the information on it um, and be able to, because they're all in the public domain, be able to use the images in their projects when they've got a, a talk that they want to give or when they are working on an astronomy book or, you know, just you need a really interesting historic image this can serve as a library to that. And so um, there's a lot of apparatus in the back that helps you to find images of comets, images of um, shooting stars, image, you know, it just, it goes on and on. Um, and to get back to your question, um, one of the things that was really tough uh, was this one here. And the poem is about an eclipse. And it's about an eclipse over the ocean. And I could find no eclipses over the ocean. And I thought, well, this is a loss. And then I was surfing somewhere, and I found an eclipse over the surface of the moon. Now, this is not the actual surface of the moon. It's a 19th century artist's imagination of what the surface of the moon might look like with an eclipse on the surface of the moon. Um, and there you can see that the sun is peeking through around the Earth. Okay, so it's not the kind of eclipse that we're used to, but I think you'll agree it's actually perfect for this because Bliss Carmen, her uh, compare, her, her, her UNB mate, um, says, how unutterably lonely is the vast gray round of sea till the yellow flower of heaven breaks and blossoms and gets free lighting up the lilac spaces with her golden density hope of sailors and of lovers swings the lantern of the sea so um i reframed a few of these in that kind of way in order to make it fit but actually in the reframing it gives uh, a fresh angle on the poem because oh that could be from the surface of, yeah they have eclipses in them okay oh this could be from the surface of Mars oh you know and you can start thinking in that sort of way so um, I included as many space images as I could in spite of the fact that in the nineteenth century we'd never been to space but Jules Verne's um, Voyage to the Moon was illustrated and so there are illustrations from that in here um, there was a very interesting group, one person in particular, who modeled the surface of the moon before we had been there in the 19th century in clay. So figured out where particular craters were, modeled the clay, and then basically made an image of the clay so you could get all the shadows and everything right. And the, you know, the resulting images are just absolutely astounding. I have one of those here. But I mean, can you imagine? That's a 19th century imagining of the surface of the moon. Um, which he went to incredible uh, trouble to put together. So, um, yeah, uh, I had a lot of fun. Um, so there should be a few surprises, if, even for you here, uh, Henry, even though you've gone through every page, I've got a few little extra uh, squibs for you. Uh, and I should also mention that um, uh, I added an extra little poem at the beginning um, from uh, one of London, Ontario's most noted poets, because we're in London, Ontario, and she's Grace Blackburn. Um, she was uh, of the Blackburn family, wrote for the paper, but also wrote for New York magazines and things like that, and uh, published poetry frequently under the pen name Fan Fan. And I discovered two very interesting things about her. First, she was the first vice president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada London Centre. You couldn't make this up, right? Um, second, she wrote an astronomy poem about the sunset's many-tinted bar where light on light a smiling iris nar mellows to mystery of near and far swings passionately pale the evening star. Queen of the twilight, from a conquered sky, she smiles to see the day grow faint and die. Thank you again.